Thanks for joining me on Life and Surround. Today's topic is the 50th anniversary deluxe edition of Machine Head by Deep Purple, offered by Rhino Records. This is a current release. It is currently available for retail and at discount. And so I want to get this news out to you. We're going to go over the deluxe set contents. I'm going to discuss the album uh, a bit from a musical and a historical standpoint, discuss some of the mixes that are available, and I'm going to compare some of the mixes that are on offer here. And hopefully you will come away from this video knowing more clearly whether you would like to buy this deluxe set, maybe enjoy it on streaming services. Perhaps if you already have it, this can just be sort of a celebration of what you enjoy about the set and maybe a commiseration of what you might not enjoy about the set. So let's talk about the contents of this set. And because this is Life in Surround and the focus is multi-channel, let's start with the Blu-ray. So the Blu-ray contains a brand new Dolby Atmos mix of the album mixed from the individual tracks sourced from the master tapes by Dweezil Zappa. It's unclear to me how much experience Dweezil has in mixing music in Atmos, but I believe I read somewhere recently that he has built an immersive mixing studio. I assume that as a part of the record label selecting Dweezil to do this Atmos mix, that his qualifications were checked as well as those of Eric Brower, who is credited with assisting the mix. So also included on the Blu-ray, for the first time ever in optical format, we have the 1974 US quadraphonic mix, which heretofore was only available on analog formats such as LP, and now it exists on Blu-ray. So that is an exciting element of this set. Also included on the Blu-ray are three bonus tracks that are sourced from this 2001 DVD audio or a little bit later reissue on Super Audio CD from CD Japan. And uh, so the whole album, the whole album plus When a Blind Man Cries is available in 5.1 on either of these, these two items, this DVD audio or the Super Audio CD. I did a comparison video of the UK quadraphonic mix, the US quadraphonic mix, and the 5.1 mix, the 2001 5.1 mix, several years ago, maybe like four years ago. And um, I went and watched that video recently just to refresh my memory of my own opinion. And I chose the 5.1 mix. Um, above the UK quad or the US quad. And I also determined that the 5.1 mix pays heavy homage to the UK quad while being just not quite as uber discreet. So in my opinion, the mix holds together rather well while offering a lot of separation between the, the parts of this band, you know, organ separated nicely from guitar, separated nicely from vocals, separated nicely from bass and drums as well. And um, a rather large drum sound that really emanates throughout the room. So I'm gonna throw this out there. If you are not in the end interested in the 50th anniversary deluxe set, because uh, really what you're getting is the digitized, the, the optical format US quad mix, and then Dweezil's Atmos mix, you may very well want to track down a copy of the album mixed in 5.1, plus When a Blind Man Cries. Okay, so I wanted to just go over the contents of the Blu-ray. So now let's go over the contents of the rest of the box, and then we'll get to a mix comparison and finally, I want to leave you with some thoughts about the controversy I've observed over the last few years of listeners in reaction to playing back Atmos mixes, particularly at home. I want to discuss um, the relative lack of consensus compared to other kinds of mixes and give some reasoning as to possibly why. 
I'm going to also discuss my system so that that can act as a little bit of a reference for when I tell you whether I like an Atmos mix or whether I don't. All right, so here is the box set outer sleeve, the, the, the box of the box, if you will. I've chosen to leave the cellophane on for now so you can see the hype sticker in its original spot. And then it comes with this uh, promotional paper sleeve and I have also left that in place. The actual back of this set looks awfully similar just without a few of the notes about the contents of the set. Here is the LP sized gatefold housing that holds the vinyl record included in the set plus the four optical discs. Let's open this thing up. Here we go. You can see it is quite purple and in some ways it replicates original album artwork. The three CDs do not have these poly liners included for their protection, but the Blu-ray does. So I certainly appreciate that as my focus and my love is with multi-channel. And so for me, the, the highlight of this set is this Blu-ray audio. And finally, here is the back of that LP size gatefold housing. And we get an image of a bass guitar headstock with four machine heads. So in case you were ever curious and didn't actually know what is a machine head, there you go. It's the tuning mechanism on a guitar, a bass guitar, or similar stringed instruments. Also included in the set is this here book. And I'm going to show off some select pages, but I just want to express some gratitude that the type is rather large. And while the contents cover a lot of information that has already been available for a long time in other releases of Machine Head. There are some brand new writings from people such as Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden and uh, Dweezil Zappa commenting on the philosophy behind his Atmos mix. I consider this book well worth reading, particularly if you've never kind of immersed yourself in the history of the album before. But if you have, there is going to be a lot of very familiar content here. But, um, you know, these, these new anecdotes are broken out into their own bubbles. And so, therefore, you could focus on what you want rather easily. Lots of nice black and white imagery plus color imagery in the book. And then, like I said, the um, well-known story for many of us, we all came down to Montro. The mobile recording rig on rent from the Rolling Stones, referenced in Smoke on the Water. Images of the recording situation plus a lyric sheet. Promotional images plus images of the infamous fire that burned down the casino because of a flare gun. Some stupid shot a flare gun off inside a venue, a wooden venue, at a Frank Zappa and the Mothers concert and uh, Deep Purple were supposed to begin writing and recording this album at that venue shortly after the show. And as many of us know, they had to scramble to find a new venue, and it's just all part of the, the fascinating and rich history of this iconic record. The fire, and as the smoke descended later on in the blaze, the band members witnessed smoke on the water the rest is history. Album and singles artwork images, more recording session and band promo photos, plus credits. And finally, on the back cover, another photo of the band. Machine Head by Deep Purple, an iconic rock album to say the least. Huge influence on bands I love, such as Iron Maiden and Rush. Produced and mixed by legendary Martin Birch. What a great record. There are few records that I would be willing to spend the time to get to know two different quadraphonic mixes, a 5.1 mix and a Dolby Atmos mix. But this record is just so well performed. It's just packed with legendary riffs and just absolutely top tier playing from all of the band members and including Ian Gillen on vocal. He just had exactly the right voice with the right power and the right range for this album. And it just is no surprise that it is 
as immensely influential as it evidently is. So the Atmos mix compared to the US quadraphonic mix, the Atmos mix has more deep bass, almost to the point when I brought this mix up to what I call my reference level. So the kick drum is just pounding me in the chest. It feels like there's a live drummer in my room. I almost felt like there is an overabundance of deep bass, like perhaps the bass was a little bit boomy. But I think that was just me really being used to the previous mixes of this album, and particularly on LP, where a lot of bass has to be rolled off. Um, as I listened through the whole album, and then especially on subsequent listens, I no longer felt the bass to be overly boomy but just I recognized that there is deep bass in this mix that has never been audible before, and it does complement the, the power and the energy and the compositional style of this record. Again, compared to the uh, US Quad, it has, in my opinion, just as much bass presence, um, audible, discernible bass. Now you do have to bring the Atmos mix up in volume considerably more than the US Quad or also any of the stereo versions in the set. It is mastered much more quietly. And so I, I guesstimate that I raised it about 10 dB above any other listening experience. And that's important because there is a point where the, the bass begins to thump and to bump, you know, to, to boom and thump, giving you that bump. And um, that helps you to feel the kick drum, even when the band is really thick. And um, so at times, the kick drum is very, very, very audible and discernible. And in that way, just from listening to it, and then at all times, like, it, I feel it's important to be able to feel the bass drum. The Atmos mix has less hiss than any other version of this album I have ever heard, and that's stereo, quadraphonic, or 5.1. There is one moment where Dweezil either couldn't eliminate hiss or chose not to. It's the beginning of Lazy, and hiss exists in much more abundance on the other versions, but it is discernible there, even on the Atmos mix. So um, just a heads up, hiss has been very well dealt with, with this Atmos mix, in my opinion, not sacrificing other elements of sound, but uh, maybe the way that that particular section was recorded, it just could not be avoided without removing important musical information. The Atmos mix is the most adventurous multi-channel mix that exists for Machine Head in terms of active panning. There are moments where the quadraphonic mixes and the 5.1 mix choose to remain very static. They they may uh, choose like a, a very interesting surround placement for parts, uh, but then they leave them there. And uh, Dweezil took maximum opportunity to have fun with this mix. In my opinion, Dweezil chose appropriate parts of the album where the band is really cutting loose, particularly instrumentally, and so Dweezil's mix cuts loose along with them. There are lots of parts of this album previously unheard that are now discernible and audible for the first time ever. And that is part of why I have felt particularly on my first listen, but even on subsequent listens, like this is a fresh listening experience. Um, I can't say that it feels like listening to the album for the first time all over again, because I'm just so familiar with the songs. But even though um, I'm gladly familiar with the songs because they're great songs, but it, it certainly did feel like a new and exciting experience. Along with deeper bass, the Atmos mix has, to my ears, more pleasant highs, particularly when cranked to a thundering level. The US quadraphonic mix can be a bit harsh, particularly in the crash cymbal hits. And uh, the Atmos mix, no matter how loud I pumped it, I brought that sucker up as loud as I dared. And I was totally sure that eventually I was going to experience some piercing frequencies. 
uh, in my ears, and I simply didn't. Uh, the mix is able to be brought up incredibly loud, just thundering like the band is really in your room. And to my ears, I experienced no discomfort. Finally, the Atmos mix includes the song When a Blind Man Cries. And in my opinion, uh, I mean, that's my favorite song from this session. It was relegated to a B-side backing the 45 RPM single of Never Before, but in my opinion, it's the strongest song here. It's the one that does the most for me. I just love it, love it, love it. It is also included as one of the 5.1 bonus tracks. But, um, you know, the Atmos mix is plenty satisfying for me. So I'm just thrilled that that Dweezil chose to mix it and include it. By comparison, the U.S. Quadraphonic mix, also included on the Blu-ray, has tape hiss clearly audible in all quiet passages of the album. So that's most song intros and then also interlude parts of songs when the band um, thins out their sound a bit. You're going to detect tape hiss. It's not criminal, you know, and it is consistent with recordings of this time period. I just wanted to offer it as, you know, a differentiation with the Atmos mix. The highs of the quadraphonic mix, as I noted a little bit earlier, talking about the Atmos mix, the highs of the quadraphonic mix are a bit harsh when this mix is brought up to reference level. And so again, for me, with a rock record, that means I've got the drums just pounding at me like a drummer's really in my room. And at that point, the crash cymbal hits on this album in particular become a bit harsh for me. There's an occasional roughness or gruffness to Ian Gillen's vocal, and that is no crime with a hard rock record. I just offer that as a differentiation from the Atmos where his vocal just doesn't have that kind of roughness. And um, I, I'm not sure I prefer one over the other. It's just something that I heard. To my ears, the mid-range of this album is a little duller or perhaps less defined or less pronounced on the quadraphonic mix opposed to the Atmos. And your mileage may vary. I prefer the mid-range sound of the Atmos mix. For both mixes brought up to that thundering drum level, the kick drum is audible and discernible during the sparser parts of the album such as the intro to Never Before. The kick drum can blend in with other parts, such as when the organ and the guitar are performing similar rhythmic responsibilities as the kick. During thicker, heavier, more raucous parts of this album, such as when you get to the meat and potatoes of Pictures of Home. So that is consistent across really all the mixes um, that I've that I've heard and insofar as I was able to pay attention to that, that feature of these mixes. The kick drum is audible at times and it blends in at others. And for all mixes, if you're listening at a level for which you're feeling the low bass, you're going to feel it at all times and um, hear it very clearly at other times. All right, so I want to give some thoughts over the lack of consensus that I have seen for Atmos mixes over the last few years, and definitely with this Dweezil Zappa Atmos mix. A lot of factors come into play that I believe make consensus very difficult and sometimes impossible. Those factors include the room you're listening in and how it has been treated or not treated for sound, whether you are using bass management on your system and how your processor handles bass management and other forms of processing to include room correction. Then you have your amplifier types, whether they're class D, whether they're class A, whether they're class AB, and so on, whether they're a part of your AVR or whether you've offboarded amp responsibilities with pre-outs. Then you have your speaker types, you have your speaker placements, you have personal expectations for what you believe the mix should sound like. And that can be like in reference to other mixes that you've heard. It can be in reference to your memories of the album in its original form. 
or even AB comparison if you kind of switch back and forth between them. There are more mixing options for the engineer at the outset. So, you know, with mono, there are fewer options for an engineer. With stereo, there are more quadraphonic, yet more 5.1, even more. And then with Atmos and RO3D, these immersive mixing formats, the mixing possibilities may be virtually infinite. And then also we have the factor of whether an album is classic or whether it's brand new. So again, if an album is classic, we are, most of us, if not all of us, are going to have these notions of how we perceive the originality of the music and um, we can enjoy deviations from that originality or it can just be distracting and disappointing, but it can set expectations and even nostalgic expectations if we're dealing with a classic album as opposed to just absolutely brand new work. And then there are differences in how we have all chosen to calibrate our systems, where we have placed our subwoofers. It could be that our systems handle certain kinds of mixing in a way that's totally pleasant to us. And then like a different style of mixing may not perform as well. And so, all right, I'm going to offer uh, just a view of my speaker configuration. This is straight off of my AVR. My speakers are situated a tiny bit differently than this, but this is more or less my setup. This is certainly what I have told my AVR to expect in uh, my speaker placement. My subwoofers aren't to scale where they are in this image, but uh, this is awfully close to how I have my speaker set up. So this is a 7.2.4 configuration. That means seven channels at ear level, and then two subwoofers and four height speakers, two front heights and two rear or surround heights. And then I just want to make a brief note that I have performed a tiny bit of a compromise with my rear heights, positioning them between where Dolby Atmos wants them and where RO3D wants them so that I can listen to both formats and not have to install like an auxiliary set of heights and like manually switch the cables over or something crazy like that. Okay. So all that being said, on my system, in my room, according to my expectations and the way that I brought this mix up to reference level, meaning a thundering drum set for all of these mixes, my favorite mix from this 50th anniversary deluxe set is the Atmos mix. There are listeners that are saying that this mix lacks satisfying bass for them. Like it's bass shy. Um, some people have called it thin. And so all I can do is offer for you that on my system, this album has copious bass, very much sufficient. And like I said, upon first listen, I wondered if it like had a bit too much. And then upon subsequent listens, I settled in on, on the sound and it totally works for me. And so, you know, that's a bit of an overall disclaimer. When I am telling you on this channel, whether an Atmos mix works for me or not, uh, it always has to be taken with a grain of salt that your experience may be different. Your expectations may be different. Your system is certainly different. Like none of our systems are the same. And certain mixes may perform uh, more satisfyingly for you on your system than others. And the same is also going to be true for me. So all I can do is really tell you how things are sounding to me. And um, then, you know, I think it's fair to also tell you that, you know, in the last few days, I have read a lot of controversy about this mix. And I think that there's uh, more than average controversy for this mix. And so it seems to me that this Atmos mix is less likely to perform well on the, the greatest number of systems than some other mixes, you know, that have come out. All right. So as far as I know, this is Dweezil Zappa's first commercial Atmos mix. 
I couldn't find information about others, though he certainly has had his hand in the mixing game with um, Zappa Play Zappa, and then um, he's at least been like technically involved in um, releases of his father's music, such as the Quadiophiliac DVD audio from quite a few years ago. All right, so is this the best Atmos mix that you know Dweezil Zappa is ever going to put out? Probably not. He's probably going to learn and grow. Does this mix perform well on my system in a way that satisfies me? Yes, it does. And it's my opinion that it may not have the average likelihood of performing well on yours. So I just offer that as a bit of buyer beware, as a bit of caution. I really do care about um, the enjoyment of music for all of you. And I, I try my best to never like steer anyone wrong. And so I, I try my best to just be very open and honest about how I'm evaluating music and um, you know potential shortfalls in particular releases. So for me, the Atmos mix here is the, the winner for me. And uh, I, you know, I would have to go throw on the entire 5.1 DVD audio or SACD to really determine whether I like one more than the other, because I like the 5.1 mix an awful lot. But I can tell you that the Atmos mix reveals things that have never been heard from the master tapes before, and it is the most adventurous and playful mix, and it does feel like a fresh new experience. And so, hey, I want to throw out there that if you are not comfortable with the $60 plus to $80 plus like after shipping price for this set, and uh, you can get it from Rhino Records, you can get it from discounters like Import CDs, probably um, discounters that are overseas for me, like JPC. So as always, just look around, but the lowest price I'm seeing is around 60 bucks, and then it's retailing for 80. So if that just doesn't seem like the right value for you, the content of this set is streaming on services such as Apple Music and Tidal. The album in Atmos, if your system is Atmos capable, and then you get the content from the CDs as well. So then commentary on the CDs, the 72 show is absolutely incredible. Uh, Machine Head was very new. It's very fresh for the band. It's a cool show and the sound quality is on point. The 71 show is um, before Machine Head existed. And so it's going to be songs that are a bit less classic and it sounds very rough in mono. It's it's basically a, an official bootleg at this point. And then the third CD is the album remixed into stereo by Dweezil Zappa. So it's the new stereo remix. And then you also get the original mix of the album remastered. So you get um, a remixed and a remastered version of the album on CD. But you can stream all of that, okay? So that may be the way to go here. And, you know, um, auditioning the Atmos mix on one of the streaming services could help you determine how the Blu-ray is going to perform on your system. Streaming Atmos has a bit less definition, particularly in the low end, but I did go give it a listen and I found it to be worthy audition material. So I would uh, go and check that out first if you're on the fence about the Atmos mix. If you're liking it streaming, um, you're probably going to love it on Blu-ray. So these have been my thoughts on the 50th anniversary set of Machine Head by Deep Purple on offer from Rhino Records. I hope this has helped you to determine whether you wish to purchase this set or maybe to stream the content. Or for those of you who already have the set, maybe I was able to um, help you celebrate or commiserate, uh, whatever the case may be. So I think I'm going to go over to quadraphonicquad.com and finally vote on this release. And it's going to be a high vote. I'm not sure. I'm thinking about it. I don't know if it'll be a perfect vote. But I think the set is cool. I am happy that I've had a chance to hear the Atmos mix on Blu-ray. I am looking forward to future work from Dweezil Zappa in Atmos. He has built an immersive mixing studio, so apparently he's rather serious about this. So thank you for watching. If you like what I do, don't forget to like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, leave comments below, share this video. 
uh, check out my eBay store, you know, buy a hat or a t-shirt. It's Lee Baggins, L-E-I-G-H Baggins. And, um, you know, thanks for all your support for watching. And until next time, live life in surround.